okay? So let's continue with the lecture and today and now we are going to discuss the cost of changes. So one of the <coughs> sentences that is most popular uh, among engineers is if it works, don't fix it. Okay, this is an old engineer saying, very well known and respected by everybody. And uh, also we have uh, the Murphy's laws. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So if we know it's already working, don't touch it. And these two combined uh, make people scared about changing ex existing things. And this is also related to the fear of change and the raises cost of change. Let's try to explain these two things. Uh, so the, the typical software development model is the waterfall. You start from the requirement, you go to design, then uh, after you design everything, you go to implementation. After implementation, you verify that your code is working, and then uh, you ship it. And uh, while, uh, while it's on the market, you keep maintaining it by solving bugs and uh, by um, basically maintaining it uh, well functioning over time okay it is still followed especially in safety critical systems and there is a modern version which is the so-called vid model which is quite similar uh, in the previous models there is a lot of emphasis on the early phases of development and in particular requirements specification and design requirements is what the client desires okay specification is more formal it's a detailed version of the requirements and often for internal use and uh, that contains technical details it contains estimate of efforts uh, can be used to derive tests and to do verification later and in safety critical system this phase is considered essential of course and it's critical for the success of software then you have to design. You break up the project into subsystems, the interaction, and again, this is considered very important since a broken design can compromise the final product functionality, the performance, etc., etc. So a lot of emphasis on these three steps, which came at the very beginning, before even writing one line of code. The problem is that without feedback, it's very important to make everything right at the beginning because after design, you start implementing, and while you implement, there is nothing you can do. You don't get any feedback. Okay? So, if something goes wrong in these three phases, then at the end, your program is not going to be successful. So a lot of emphasis on this in these three phases, okay? Of course, this is not how it works in practice because requirements are always imprecise. The client, the customer, is not actually very good at specifying exactly what he wants. And they are often volatile, so they change with time and sometimes in conflict within them. So at the beginning, customer says one thing, then changes his mind and says another thing. Specification are always incomplete because requirements are imprecise. So the specification can only be incomplete, not precise. Sometimes not even existing, you start directly from the requirements. Of course, you can make errors in the early phase of design, especially when you don't have very clear where you're going. And so it's very necessary later on to patch the design and the code and the test quite often. And remember always that errors are in human nature, so it's okay to have errors somewhere. In the two models that we consider, we have the so-called uh, cost of change over time. At the beginning, uh, if you change something in the requirements, it's not such a big deal. It doesn't cost mu much, actually costs nothing. If you do a change while you are designing, okay, it costs a little bit more, but not so much. If you make a change while you are coding, the cost is much more because now uh, you have to go back, see if your design still uh, meets their new requirements, so there is uh, some more. If you make a change while you are testing, changes as you have to go back to design and coding 
to change a lot of things so the cost is going to increase if you want to change something when you are in production that's the most costly okay so you have a raising cost of change as the um, software progress towards the end so there is a fear to change anything especially if it works at the same time changes happens naturally because you discover the hardware is not adequate, so you need a more powerful hardware. Or you discover your design is not very flexible. Or maybe your design is too flexible. Or at some point the customer wakes up and uh, has uh, one new requirement he forgot to add at the very beginning. Or uh, you discover that some module is extremely difficult, it will not be ready on time, and so on and so forth. So there is something, so there is a, a, lot, a gap between what is naturally happening, a lot of changes, and what we pretend to solve by pretending uh, no change. And this gap uh, produces a lot of stress. Uh, also the code starts degradating because uh, changing something, the design is difficult, expensive and highly feared when you are in the coding stage. So when you are in the coding stage, you discover you have to change the design, it's a big problem because, uh, you know, what you have already done may not work anymore. So problem is the requirements, specification design are solved by modification in the code rather than in design itself. So patches, acts, things like that such patches starts accumulating little by little and what at the end you have is an unclean and messy code which is very difficult to understand okay so if you have to i already show you this uh, this picture but just to have a, a look again this is uh, what is called a code monster look at this function it's a segue analysis is an Italian function. Okay, <laughs> this is an Italian programmer that brought this function, and uh, it's supposed to return an array list. And look at how long is this function. Okay, so just imagine doing some change here. I mean, just reading the function would take several hours. And this is just one function. And, uh, and so if somebody tells you, hey, we have to do a little modification, we need to do also this other thing in this, in this function. Well, I mean, I will not, uh, I don't want to be in the, in the, in the shoes of uh, the poor programmer that has to go through this code. And this is probably comes from the fact that this function was built in an incremental way. Every time adding something more, every time adding something more or changing or adding one new requirement, then you should do this, but yes, but you should also do that, and so So it, chances are that the function started simple, just a few, you know, tens of lines of code, and then after a while, it just became a monster. And the more you feed it, the bigger it grows. Uh, so this is an example of code degradation. Every programmer can tell there is a difference between clean and dirty code, and can see such difference when he sees it. Dirty code causes stress, while clean code is easier to maintain, the bug and the stand. So in a perfect world, we will always have to deal with clean code and no programmer wants to deal with the such huge functions. So the dream is what if the cost of change remains constant across the software development life cycle? What if it would be very easy to change something here? Of course that's not very realistic so let's do like that. Okay, So very small cost is slightly increasing over time. So how can you do that? Well. Uh, people came out with this technique, it's called refactoring. The basic idea behind that is that if we could continuously maintain the code and keep it clean and simple as possible, it is easier to change it. Of course, to keep uh, your code clean requires a method. Okay? The code cleaning must become routine and be integrated into the process. 
Is it worth to maintain the code clean? Well, yes, it depends on how many changes you anticip anticipate in your process. If there are many changes, if you need to be flexible and uh, agile, then uh, it's better to have your code clean and to be able to, to change it easily. So this, this, there is a story that you can read in the book called Refactoring by Martin Fowler. And um, the story goes like that. There was a consultant, which was Martin Fowler, which made a visit to a development project. And during the analysis of the project, he discovered that the hierarchy of classes was uh, a little bit messy. It could be improved. So he told the project management to spend some time cleaning up the code. And of course, the manager said, what? I mean, it's working, why should we should modify it? Also, we are behind. There is a still a lot to do. We are under time and cost budget, so no way we are going to spend time just cleaning the code. It's not useful time, and we are already late. So the consultant, instead of talking to the management, talked to programmers and convinced the programmers that there were problems and so the programmer spent a couple of days cleaning the code. So the amount of code was reduced significantly, it was clearer, and it was easier to change. But the managers were not happy. They felt that these two days were completely lost. Lost, loss of money. Who cares about nice code? If it works, who cares? The client does not care, so we do not care. So the manager sent the consultant away. You made us lost money because of these two wasted day, days. The consultant was Martin Fowler and the end of the story is that the project was cancelled because it was too late. And so after a while they called another consultant, which was Ken Beck, the author of Extreme and Programming, and they started rewriting the code from scratch. So basically, without considering the old messy code. The reason of the failure was that the code was too heavy and too complex to debug and maintain. So actually, the waste of time was due to the fact that it was difficult to make modification to the existing code because of its complexity. So what is Martin Fowler is saying in his book, Refactoring, it is much better to keep the code clean so that you can easily change it. So how can we keep the code clean? So uh, they came up with this uh, method, it's called refactoring. So what is refactoring? Okay, the factoring is the process of changing a software system in such a way that it does not modify the external behavior, but improves its internal structure. So basically improving the design of existing software after the software has been written. Usually you design first and then you code. And while you code, you just comply with the design. And after you coded, that's it. Fix it. Now the proposal is let's take the code and change its internal structure. So it's design without changing its behavior. Of course, you cannot do that in one single step. You have to do that step by step using a, a rigorous and almost formal sequence of steps okay and at every step you have to run all the tests to see if the code is still doing what it expects to do so basically you need to have a, a very good test suite that tests that your program is working correctly and then you do a little modification and you run again all the tests and then a new modification and you run again all the tests and step by step little by little you improve the design, you simplify the code, you reduce the amount of lines of code, you improve its performance, and so on and so forth. Why you need to do that? Just to make the, the code nicer? Just to make the code more beautiful? And in particular, is beauty of code really important? Of course not. The things that matter are functionality and performance. So if it works and if works well, that's all you need. However, beauty is not independent of other nice properties because simple is beautiful. Independent, uh, isolated uh, software is beautiful. Flexible is beautiful and so on. So in other words, 
If the code is beautiful, nicely structured, it's also a code that has a lot of useful properties that will make our life e uh, easier later on. So if the code is nicely structured, you can most probably improve its performance later on. Uh, okay, so I just skip this and uh, okay, so when not to refactor. Uh, so there are two uh, cases in which is not the case to refactor. You don't have to refactor if your starting code has bugs. So if you don't have a test suite to check that everything is correct, it's better not to refactor at all because by refactoring you may introduce bugs. Okay, and so mm, it's better to not do anything basically. So the first step is to be sure that the code is working. And so uh, that every transformation has to maintain the code correct. Otherwise, you cannot refact. If there are bugs, the first thing you have to do is to solve the bugs, write the test, and repeat until the problems are solved. Once all tests run smoothly, you can refact. OK, so too many bugs. Maybe it's better to start from scratch. No, do not refactor when you are close to a deadline because refactoring pays off in the long term after the deadline. So if you are in a real hurry, maybe you could postpone a little bit the refactoring. So refactoring is not an absolute uh, you know, law. It's something uh, uh, people should apply with care. So where to start? Uh, OK, test we already said. Refactoring. What is refactoring? So we said is uh, the, the doing a set of steps which will transform your code step by step. Okay. In the book Refactoring, uh, Martin Fowler lists uh, uh, something like 72 refactoring methods. Okay. Of course, we are not going to present all of them. I'm just going to give you a flavor by presenting some of these refactoring methods at uh, the simplest to show. Okay. Okay. Just one second. Okay. So uh, you can go to a web page called refactoring.com, which is maintained by Martin Fowler, and which contains a catalog of refactorings. Okay. This is refactorings in alphabetical order. Every refactoring has a name. And if you click on the name of the refactoring, like this one, there is a little bit of explanation. Okay, and then of course there is also a reference in the book. Um, so actually, I guess that since the book was written, uh, a lot of additional uh, uh, methods were introduced. Okay like for example this one reduce scope of variable is not in the original book huh? and uh, here it's described uh, how you should do that some of these refactorings are uh, actually so automatic that they are implemented in um, they are implemented in some tools for example the eclipse uh, um, the Eclipse um, IDE implements some refactoring automatically. Usually you select a portion of code and then you click on the menu and you say, for example, I don't know, extract method. And then the refactoring is applied automatically and after that you run the tests to see if everything is still okay. okay. So some of these can be automated quite easily. So I'm going to describe them. So uh, when uh, you should refactor? Well, in the book, the authors say that code should be refactored when it smells. So when you see there is something that is not really right. And so there are um, <coughs> a few smells, for example, duplicated code. If you see a lot of code duplicated around your files, then uh, it's the time that maybe to apply some of the refactoring methods. Or when you see a method which is too long, like the one I showed you before, then again, 
this is males and it's this should be uh, it should be refactored or when you have a switch statement which statement is really anti object oriented pattern so you should refactor it and so on and so forth so now we are going to see a few um, methods for addressing duplicate code and one method to address the switch statement smell so let's look at the first one so why duplicated code is bad well duplicated code is bad because if you have to change it you have to change it everywhere okay and so it's not very nice uh, the best way to, to do that is to generalize the code and put the common code in a separate method or in the, a separate class mm -hmm. when the code is exactly the same it's very easy what you do is to use one thing that's called extract method and then you substitute the duplicated code with a call to the new method from all the places if the code is in two classes derived from the same base class you can use extract method and pull up field if the similar code is in two related classes you can consider extract class and then some something else so let's look at extract method so this is w one of the simplest method is also contained in, the, in eclipse so let's look at how it works so basically uh, suppose you have uh, something like that print all which prints a banner and then prints this and you want to 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 extract this code the one that is printing name and amount into a different function the examples are in java because uh, the original book is about java but of course exactly the same things can be applied in c plus plus okay so you have these two lines of code you want to remove and put in a separate function okay when to use it in case of duplicated code or in case a method is too long and you want to split it in what what's uh, the mechanics you take some code which is in one function and you make it into another function and of course the original code is substituted with a function call uh, why you want to do that because more methods are more readable easier to debug and to understand what you have to do is of course to pay attention to names mm -hmm. and there is a reverse of this method which is called inline method which is basically when you have a function which is too silly you want to inline it so what is the mechanics so this is the sequence of steps you have to apply to apply the refactoring so the first thing to do is to create a new method the target method so in this case we create a new method print details You copy the code to be extracted into the target method. You scan the extracted code for reference to any variable that is local to the source method. Here, for example, we just copied and we see that amount is uh, something which is local to this function so we create a parameter amount which we are going to pass okay local temporary variables that are used only in the scope of the structured code become local variables in the new method local variables they are used both in the source method and in the extract code become parameters of the method they can be passed by value or reference depending on the use in the two methods and then we try to eliminate or minimize parameters passed by reference either by using an appropriate return value or by splitting the code in a different way okay after we do this copy we compile if everything goes okay we delete the extract code from the source method and we replace it with a method call and finally we compile and test so you see this is quite uh, almost automatic and with a little bit of analysis of the code that can be done automatically by an ID and this in fact is what Eclipse is going to do you select a portion of code like this you select 
and then you click on extract method it's going to ask you the name of the new method and the name of the parameters and then it's going to create this automatically so no chances for error let's do another example we have this function okay which is going to take uh, all the elements in these orders then it prints a banner then what it does it goes uh, through all the elements okay and sums it into variable outstanding and then it prints outstanding on the screen and what you want to do is to uh, s substitute the central part okay with a function so what you are going to do is to print banner then outstanding is going to get outstanding and then print details outstanding and this is the new function so what we did is to create the new function then take this code copy in the new one return the value we need to return and assign to this variable and then print it so this is quite simple okay so extract method is actually one of the most common and uh, it would be very useful to apply extract method a few times into this monster code right at least try to understand what's going on so some of these should be split into more functions uh, another method I'm going to, to show you is the replace method with method object what is that so sometimes you have a very long and complex uh, function that uses a lot of local variables a lot of them and also the local variables are used in a very complex way so it's very difficult or almost impossible to use extract method because you would need to pass too many local variables to the new method okay and so suppose you have this uh, price which is going to use all these local variables in a very complex way so very difficult to to do an extract method so uh, what we are going to do is to take the code here and put everything into a new class and this new class is going to have as member variables exactly the local variables that were in the method and the code is going to go into a compute method okay now in the original order class the price function first creates an object PC okay which is going to create this and then returns PC compute okay so the mechanics are you create a new class you name it after the method so this was price price calc you give the new class one field pointing to the original object so it's not shown here but here there should be a field which points to class order so when you create price calcs you pass this and this is going to be stored somewhere inside the point inside the price cal calc class and why this so you that you can call methods on it in fact here there may be uh, some call to methods of order and since we are going to move this code here we should be able to call these methods by using this pointer you give the new class one field for every local variable in the source method and for every parameters this has no parameters so no problem and then one method for every variable then you create uh, the constructor to take all parameters and fill up the fields so again this has no parameters so the constructor price calc doesn't need to initialize anything otherwise if this has add the parameter 
the constructor of calc had to take these as parameters. Create a method called compute and copy all the source method into compute. Compile. If it compiles OK, you replace the source method code with the creation of the new object and a call to compute. You compile and test it. And everything works, you are done. OK, but why you want to do that? Well, because now it's easier to refactor compute than to refactor the original price. Because now all local variables are into the object. And so refactoring compute is much easier than refactoring price because the variables are going to be passed across functions. So you can split compute in several functions. Okay? So now you can refactor the long compute method as you wish with the extract method because all local variables are now fields. And so you can change the code as you wish. Once it is being simplified, you may discover that the object is no longer necessary, or you may discover that you actually you reduce it a lot, the amount of code, because now the algorithm, the resulting algorithm is much more simple. Okay? Uh, let's continue. Pull up. Pull up is quite easy. Uh, it happens when you have a field that is duplicated in two sibling classes. Uh, and this is pull up field. So you have a, a base class, two derived classes, and the two derived classes have the same field. Uh, you have to pay attention because it may or may not exactly the same. You have to check that it's actually the same, not just that it has the same name, but it's actually used in the same way. In that case, you can take that field and put in the base class as a protected uh, common member between the two derived classes. Okay. Uh, okay. You can do the same with a method. Uh, you have to be a little bit more careful because first of all, you should check if the two methods in the two sibling classes are actually doing the exactly the same thing. If they are not identical but just similar, you could first use extract method on both to generalize a common core and later you take this common core and you pull up in the base class. Uh, one problem is when the methods refer other methods that are in the derived classes. So in such a case maybe you may want to define virtual methods in the base class so that the call is redirected appropriately. So you have to be careful there on how to do things. So this is exactly the sequence of steps you have to follow. You first inspect the methods to ensure they are identical. And if they are not, you should consider first some other refactoring to make them identical. For example, extract method. If they have this different signatures, you first make them uniform, compile, and test. So you give, for example, the two methods the same name. Once they have the same name, you create a method in the base class you copy the code, again you compile and test. If everything works, you delete one of the two sub subclass methods, compile and test. If everything works, you delete the other subclass method, compile and test, and you continue like that until you remove all the common methods in all subclasses, and every time you compile and test. Okay? Also, you have to search where the method is called, and if done via, via pointer, see if you can change the pointer type to the base class so to generalize even more. Okay, so uh, let's observe that in the three um, refactoring method they present to you, the, the, the mechanics is always the same. You first uh, introduce a copy and you compile. And after, uh, only when uh, everything compiles OK, you start removing the duplicates. And you remove the duplicates one by one, and every time you remove something, you compile and test. So you're sure now that you can check 
at which stage you made an error because if after removing the first one uh, you got an error then you understand that it's just that specific class is going to have a problem and so you know where to look for errors so here we have again a very very simple example you have a regular customer which has a function create bill and charge for and preferred customer as create bill and charge for and uh, and customer as add bill and last bill date and you realize that charge for is going to call create bill but can be generalized so you put that up okay and uh, you make charge for virtual and then create bill is moved up okay okay let's see now another one is called extract class so extra class is when you have one class that does the work that should be done by two remember at the beginning of our software design patterns we said that one of the principles that should be followed the solid principle is that the first one is that you should have a single responsibility so a class should have one single responsibility which is one single reason to change if this is not the case you may consider splitting the class and so extra class is doing like that is taking one class which does too many things and splitting that in two that's not always very easy because sometimes the class is too big to understand easily what's going on so splitting that is not so difficult so easy okay so the first thing you should do is to decide how to split of course and this depends uh, uh, on the fact that you should uh, be able to uh, analyze the class and understand which are th its responsibilities so for each responsibilities you should create a new class okay and if the responsibility of the old classes no longer matches name you should rename of course the old class so you first create a new class to express the split of responsibilities then you make a link from the old to the new class in certain cases you may need a two-way links so in the first class you have a pointer to the split class and in the split class you have a pointer to the original class uh, then you use uh, something that is called move field which we'll see in a while which is used to move a field from one class to another one after each move you compile and test and you do that until you have actually split the two classes uh, you should start with lower level methods called rather than calling and build the higher level compile and test after each move after that you review and reduce the interfaces of each class because sometimes you realize that some of the things that were in the, in the first place are not needed anymore so you may remove if you did have a two-way link you may examine to see whether it can be made one way so to simplify even more and then uh, finally you have to decide whether to expose the new class so if you make it available to the customer if you do expose the class decide whether to expose it as a reference object or as an immutable value object okay so let's look at this move method so move method is moving one method from one class to another class so this is probably one of the most complicated because you have to be pay really attention at what you are doing uh, so you have class 1 and class 2 a method in class 1 should be moved to class 2 so moving method is the bread and butter of refactoring you have to move method when classes have too much behavior so you have to delegate some behavior 
Now classes are collaborating too much, they are too highly co coupled, so you want to move some responsibility to one class to another one. By moving methods around, classes become simpler and they end up being a more crisp implementation of a set of responsibilities. So you start by examining all features used by the source method. They are defined on the source class. Okay. So for example, suppose you have a method that uses a couple of fields. <coughs> Should I move the fields or not? Oh, you have to decide. If you want to move the fields, you have to understand where these fields are used uh, elsewhere in the class and decide if you have to move everything or not. If the feature is going to be shared by the two classes, of course you need some way to access it from one class to another class. So you may need links and things like that. Okay? Also you have to check a soup a super a super classes of the source class for other declaration of the method because you are moving a method and if this method has been overloaded or overridden somewhere else in the hierarchy then it may be a problem with polymorphism with everything so you have to check exactly and carefully what you are moving once you decide to move well that's not so difficult you have to declare the method in the target class you may also choose a, to use a different names. You have to copy the code from the source method to the target and you have to adjust the method to make it work in this new home. So if the method uses its source, you need to determine how to reference the source object. For example, by inserting a link. If there is no mechanism in the target class, you have to pass the source object reference to the new method as a parameter. If the method includes exception handles, decides which class should logi logically handle the exception, the source class or the new class. If the source class should be responsible, leave the handlers behind. Then you compile the target class. Uh, no code has, has been removed yet. Until now you just uh, copied code, not removed, but just copied. Okay. So now determine how to reference the correct target object from the source. So you have to look where this method has been called to see how it is called. Okay? Because you are moving from one class to the other, so you have to understand how this call is going to be performed. There may be an existing field or method that will give you the target. If not, see whether you can easily create a method that will do so. Uh, so you have to be careful of, uh, about a lot of things. Finally, you turn the source method into a delicating method. You compile and test, and you decide whether to remove the source method altogether or retain it as a delegating method. Leaving the source as a delegating method is easier if you have many references, because at that point you just don't need to go through all your code to adjust everything. If you remove the source method, replace all reference with the reference to the target method. Okay? Every time you do one of these modifications, you have to compile and test, compile and test, compile and test. And finally, you can remove the old method and compile and test. So the example here is, suppose you have uh, this class, which has two methods, overdraft, charge, and bank charge okay and then uh, account as uh, an object type of type account type and days overdrawn is a field of this class and this days overdrawn is used by overdraft charge okay and is actually used also from bank charge so suppose you decide to move overdraft charge into account type. So overdraft charge, this method, moves from class account into class account type. Okay? So first you copy the method body over the account type and get it to fit. So, 
this is class account you take this function and you copy over account type notice that overdraft charge here doesn't take any parameter and uses this overdrawn which is a field but in account type there is no field called days overdraw so what we do is we put that as a, uh, also notice that days overdrawn is used in read mode so we are not modifying it so basically the thing we can do is to add days overdrawn as a parameter okay so we modify the code to take into account the fact that this overdrawn is a parameter. Then you replace the source method body with a simple delegation. Overdraft charge is completely removed and is substituted by type dot overdraft charge. and here we were using overdraft charge we substitute with type dot overdraft charge last step we can delete this okay uh, if I'm going to use many variables from this source class, not just this overdrawn, but many others, that it may be the case to pass a reference to the original object into overdraft charge. So instead of having overdraft charge pass the single parameter, and to avoid too many parameters here, I just pass all the object, a reference to the entire object, like this. Okay? And so, of course, inside I can do whatever I want. Okay, last one, I'm going very fast now. A conditional, so when you have uh, a switch case, switch case is not very good for uh, object oriented programming, so if we could substitute, it would be better. That's a very easy uh, case in which we are switching depending on a type parameter, which is an integer, an enumeration between European, African, Norwegian, blue. And then doing different things depending on this type. Okay? And, uh, well, it's easier to say that if I have a type field, I should transform that into a real type in C++ or in Java or in any things. So what I can have is a, a generic type bird which gets speed and then three types European, African, Norwegian blue which are types of birds. And uh, now the switch happens on the type so get speed is actually a function which is called on a bird and uh, dynamic binding is going to take care of everything. So the mechanics are, so it's simpler to, to show how to do that than to actually uh, explain all the mechanics because it's going to be a little bit complicated to take into account all the possible cases. So let's have a, a quick look. Before you can begin with replace conditional with polymorphism, you need to have the necessary inheritance structure. So uh, if you already have this structure, that's not a problem. If you don't have the structure, you need to create it. So that means that you have to create this structure. Okay? If the conditional statement is one part of a larger method, you first isolate it and use a extract method. So if this switch was embedded in a very large function, you extract it into a function get speed which only contains the switch. If necessary, you use move method to place the conditional at the top of the inheritance structure. So the first thing you put this get speed into the top class. 
Okay, so then pick one of the subclasses. You create a subclass method that overrides the conditional statement method. You copy the body of that leg of the conditional statement into the subclass method and adjust it to fit. So you start by creating get speed into European and you copy this part. Okay. Compile and test. You remove the copied leg of the conditional statement, compile and test. You repeat for each leg of the conditional statement until all legs are turned into subclass methods. Finally, you make the subclass method abstract. So you virtualize get speed. Okay. Another example, suppose you have an employee which internally has a field type and the type can be engineering manager or salesman. And suppose you have this function, pay amount for a certain employer, which obtains the type code. And if it's an engineer, it's going to give this. If it's a salesman, it's going to add the commission. If it's a manager, it's going to add the bonus. And the engineer is the one that's paid less, of course. Uh, okay. I change the pay amount method in employee to delegate to the new class. So I move that pay amount into a new class which is called type, employee type. T type pay amount by passing this. Then you copy the engineering leg of the case statement into the engineering class. carry on until all methods are implemented. And finally, you declare the superclass method abstract. So in the employee type, I'm going to virtualize. Abstract is the Java keyword in a, in a C++ that would be virtual equal to zero. Okay? So we were able to split the switch statement into the different classes. Okay, so just a conclusion of this course, uh, of this lecture on this course. So in this lecture we have seen some, I would say, software engineering technique, because this is more than programming technique or software engineering technique. So we have seen that it's very good to have unit testing to control uh, the way you, uh, your software works, and that unit testing should be done uh, uh, in a proper way to ensure that everything is going to work and uh, then we started to look at agile programming and the four control variables and the cost of change and finally we have presented some method to simplify the code and to make it more beautiful because making code more beautiful actually introduces a lot of nice properties that help us deal with change and simplify our programming. Okay, so this was the last lecture of the course and um, as I said, I'm available for helping you with the project in the next days. So send me emails if you have doubts or any kind of need for help. I guess I'm going to give you the results of the assignments for those who gave me the assignments on Monday or Tuesday, Tuesday at most and, um, and I'm waiting you at the exam of course. Okay. Also one thing I'm going to do in the next days is to post on the website a few possible questions I will ask you at the oral. Okay, so I have a few tests I, ga I gave uh, to people in the past with the standard questions, so I'm going to post that on the website so you could get uh, some uh, training on uh, uh, the kind of question I'm going to ask uh, to you during the exam. One last thing I would like to tell you is that uh, mm, uh, well, if you go to um, uh, 
if you go to Absutter website, um, Absutter is um, one of the most influential programmers uh, in C++. It's part of the C++ standard and uh, in the past he ran uh, one uh, series of posts called uh, uh, the Guru of the Week in which uh, he was posting questions and the week after he was giving answers. And this was done um, many years ago, but now the C++11 has been uh, uh, out uh, since some months, is doing that again. So basically is uh, proposing the old questions with a new focus on C++11. So I recommend you um, to go and look at his blog, and you will see something like this. It's called GOTW, which means Guru of the Week. And these are questions, and uh, and then you find also the solutions uh, after one week. So, for example, one typical questions I'm going to ask you are is something like that. So you could uh, exercise yourself by looking at his problems and his solutions. So, for example, uh, let's look at the guru of the week number five overriding virtual functions so uh, this is class based with a few virtual functions and the, its implementation then you have a, a derived class which overrides a few and then you have a main in which something is done and what you have to do is to uh, answer what could be improved in the code correctness of style and what did the programmer probably expect the program to print well, what is the actual results so try to understand this code and to answer the questions and why some question I mean why of the answer and after you do that you can go to the following post and look at the solution okay so here we have the solution and it's going to explore to explain you everything about it okay so the uh, the, the website is herbsutter.com so take advantage of this free material on internet okay that's it for today thank you very much and see you at the exam bye bye